Okay, here we are going live. Today is March 7th of 2024 uh, and it's time for our live stream. I'm Dave Kassler, amateur radio call sign KE0OG here with our regular Thursday evening live stream. Uh, I recognize that a lot of people will be off watching the State of the Union address, which is happening in 15 minutes. Um, I know it's a, a big political thing to see if he can look his sharpest. And, you know, a lot of people talk about him being an old man. Of course, his opponent is only three years younger. Uh, <laughs> And they're both older than I am, and I've been feeling pretty old recently. I went to the doctor yesterday, and he was quite concerned about my balance issues. So I've got to go to therapy for that and learn how to stand up straight. you think they would have taught me that in the military, but uh, I guess it didn't last. Also tonight, we will be giving away the February giveaway which is this right here. There have been very few entrants. And so I've got right here. Um, and then our giveaway for uh, March is this radio right here. This is a Redivus. And it is a RA89 FM only radio. And a very nice one. Indeed, I like this radio. Um, but how many handhelds do I need? So let's get this out where somebody can use it and do some good with it. So this will be the March giveaway. Now to enter the giveaway, as usual, you send a QSL card, postcard, or an envelope with a single sheet of paper in it to... Dave Kassler, KE0OG, P.O. Box 98, Ridgeway, Colorado, 81432. Okay? And in that, what I need is your name and call sign and the shipping address and your phone number in case I have questions about getting something to you. Now, what do I do with these? Um... We use them to select the winner of the giveaway. I pay the shipping on this. It's completely free to you. You don't have to pay to enter. And um, also, uh, I take all the other entries, put them in the uh, uh, shred pile, and I do not keep any information. The winner's entry goes in the box back to him or her. And uh, that way we keep uh, privacy on this whole thing. So, uh, some people logged on before I did. Um, so I want to say hello to Optical Man Jeff, KE0KRO. Um, hi Dave and all Augies from Sioux Falls, South Dakota, where it's 34 degrees and cloudy. Sioux Falls, South Dakota, okay. And Trap spam -a lot. Uh, hi, Dave and Augie's from Memphis. We're at 63 with 80% humidity. Can you explain when a coil on an antenna is a trap as opposed to loading coil and vice versa? Okay. Um, usually, but not always, loading coils are put on, well, anything, any kind of antenna near the beginning of it, like near where the coax connects. You add inductance to an antenna that is too short. An antenna that is too short appears capacitive. So if you add enough inductance, you can cancel that out, and the antenna will resonate um, at the frequency you want. Whether it will be at 50 ohms resistive is anybody's guess, but uh, that will allow it to shorten it. Now, you can also place loading in the middle of an antenna and what that does is it electrically shortens the antenna uh, so that you can fit it into a smaller space. Now what's a trap? 
The trap looks an awful lot like a loading coil. Some of them have capacitors. All of them rely on capacitance and inductance. So if you have an inductor with the leads very closely together, there can be enough capacitance there that that acts as a tuned circuit, a capacitor and an inductor, and it will resonate on a certain frequency. So you set that up so that if uh, it resonates, say, halfway through the antenna, you've got a 40 meter antenna, halfway through you put a little bit of a loading, or a trap, a trap, which is a coil and a capacitor, and sometimes the only capacitance is that from the windings of the coil. But what happens is that thing resonates, whereas loading coils don't. They, loading coils help the antenna to resonate. A uh, trap will resonate at a certain frequency. So like if you uh, try to use the 40 meter antenna on 20 and you've got the trap set to resonate on 20, it in essence provides an infinite resistance and cuts off the ends of the wire and the only wire that the antenna sees is the 20 meter portion. So trap, traps, it, it keeps radio waves below a certain frequency from passing by. A coil, a loading coil adds inductance to a two short antenna and two short antennas are capacitive so you get those two to work together and you get an electrically shortened antenna. If you do it right, you can still get out a signal just like a dipole. It'll be a unity gain antenna, uh, but it'll have narrower bandwidth. So sometimes if you put a trap that... Now, can a trap also act as a loading coil for what follows? Yes, it can. And it does that it, it, like in the uh, Alpha Delta DXEE antenna has a full length 20, a trap, and then a short 40. So the trap is not only stopping the, the 20 from going further, but it is electrically shortening the 40 meter part of the antenna. And the compromise there is it will not cover the entire 40 meter band. Which part it will cover is up to you. You could have it cover the lower part for FT8, or you could have it cover the upper part for a single sideband. So, hope that helps. Um, Sean, KM6NFO, hello and good to see you. Thanks for the QSO last week. Great fun to get on the air. 73 from Sacramento, where it is sunny and 59 degrees. Nice break from the rain, I can imagine. And Sean also includes a super chat right here from Sean, KM6NFO, $20. And thank you very much. That goes into the chat revenue, which uh, helps to, you know, pay the expenses and stuff like that. Uh, it's free to watch videos on YouTube, but it's not free to put them on. I don't have to pay YouTube anything. They do that all themselves. They make their money from advertising. And they give me a little cut of that. Um, but cameras, paying an assistant, so on and so forth. And pretty soon here, I'm going to have to rent a... Uh, mechanical lift, you know, bucket lift, so I can get up and fix this uh, hex beam. We fixed it, had some people come over and fix it, and then we had some pretty high winds, and it unfixed the fix. So I have to go fix it harder, so it won't come undone. Also, I just about lost the antenna from going over, but um, I think what must have happened, because the knots on the cord were very different from what I had put on there, I think the person who kept it from falling over is my next door neighbor. Uh, actually, her son or husband or whatever. Anyway, somebody came over and fixed that, and I really appreciate it. It kept the whole thing from crashing, because if it had crashed, it would have snapped the fiberglass poles, and I would have been without a hex beam. Okay, let's see. So, Sean, thank you very much. Leo Gustafsson, uh, KK7CLY, checking in from Albany, Oregon, 39 degrees and mostly clear. 
Marty PK 7 CMI. Hi, David Augie's from Central Montana. We're just 29 degrees in clear skies. It is 33 here with 90% humidity. It's been trying to precipitate all day and failing. You just get a little bit. Um, Adam Earhart. Hey, Dave, just got the MFJ cobweb based on your recommendation. Loving it. That's great. It's a fun antenna and it does not take very much uh, ground space. And there are two versions of that. There's one that'll do 20 and up and the other, uh, and you can get a kit to upgrade it if you decide you want to. It will add 40 and 30 to that. And mine, I had one, uh, but a deer took it out. The deer was running through the backyard at night. And the, of course, the guy rope was black, black to prevent the UV impact on it. And that animal just ran right up the guy line, yanked out the, the uh, stake that I had it in with. The antenna went over and the deer got all tangled up in it. And in its frantic ev event, it, in its frantic attempt to get loose, utterly destroyed the antenna. I mean, it was broke to bits, wire was broken, everything. I and mean, unfortunately, the deer was not hurt that I could tell because there was no deer there in the morning. So, uh, but I was going to give it to somebody at the club to repair, but I looked at it a little more closely and I said, sorry, the thing went in the trash. It's just unrepairable. So that's always a problem when you're living out in the country. We are not just sharing space with the wild animals. We are intruding upon their space. And they were here first, and, and they like us to remember that from time to time. So let's see. Oh, good. I'm glad you're enjoying the cobweb. There is a video or two on, on my channel. Chip Weekly, K3BEW. Hi, Dave and Augie's Worldwide from the Great Smoky Mountains of uh, Western North Carolina. Weather, B-I-N-O-V-C. Okay. Uh, you're going to have to uh, tell me what that one is. I'm trying to think if that matches anything I've learned in aviation. Five mile, 40 degrees, five mile visibility, I guess. Chuck Schreiber, good evening, Dave and all Augies, and 5KVO from the Hill Country of South Texas. Currently 70, so nice, with some overnight storms in the forecast. Looking forward to Thursday night class with Dave. By the way, we had one lightning strike today, our first of the year, and it was kind of far away, but I went through here and turned all the switches to ground for all of my uh, antennas. Um, Leo Gustafson said, I had a closer look at my buddy pole hex beam and found that three of the spreader poles had broken off flush with the preceding pole section. I've reached out to Chris at buddy pole and hopefully I can get parts. The spreader poles are not listed on their site. I could mic out the inner Cir circumference and make some slip sleeves if I can't get parts. Yeah, the buddy pole is not intended to be a permanent antenna. Buddy pole antennas are portable, but they make that um, hex beam. I saw one once at Pacificon a few years ago, and my goodness, that thing was big. And uh, we were in one of those hotel ballrooms where they had the vendors. Boy, that thing was way up there. But it really is designed to be portable. So I'm sorry to hear that the poles broke off flush with the preceding pole section. That shouldn't be. It shouldn't be designed that way. But, you know, again, um, anywhere. Leo, good luck with that project. Uh, Theodore. Uh, to Echo Zero, Golf India Yankee, good morning from the middle of the night in the UK. It is 0159, so it'll be 0200 
two hours after midnight very shortly okay by the way I did get my new QSL card so I have QSL cards the last one from the old went out this is my QSL card now and it talks about it's got the URL for my uh, YouTube channel and then the confirmation stuff in the back and yes it's supposed to look like a theme of having been typed because that way I can type the information on it note that it's vertical over here so I can just put it in the typewriter hit one hit the carriage return and just bang 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 down the side and and there it is and now I intend intend to send out QSL cards for all our um, Thursday Thursday evening contacts we'll have some more tonight and um, if you would like to QSL back I'd sure appreciate that I know that uh, some um, don't have QSL cards or would rather do it in the logbook of the world I will eventually get this in the logbook of the world but it could take a year or two it's gonna be a while I'm uh, I keep a a uh, written log and boy that looks really good 23 February that was 23 and uh, it was even messier on the 29th of February now what I like to do is if I have the radio and my computer together then I can just type in the stuff as I do the QSOs but I can't do that from side to side so we'll see what we can do okay <clears throat> Von Ziggle has put ten dollars into the chat revenue thank you very much this is his third ever super chat on a live stream so thank you very much <coughs> <coughs> yes I have a cold <coughs> oh. so it's at the doctor yesterday he says well if you've still got that cold in the week give me a call so he told me to get some of this stuff which helps with the congestion and so on so anyway von ziggle thank you very much um glenn martin hello from far west missouri we have rain and zero qft well i hope you don't end up with thunderstorms theodore why is there so little information about slot antennas there is some um a slot antenna is sort of a negative imprint of an antenna for example if you cut out a piece uh, 19 plus 19 is 38 38 if you take a piece of metal and cut out a strip in the middle it's 38 inches long you can connect the coax on either side of the strip now you have to do it very near the end of the strip to be 50 ohms it'll be a much higher impedance if you go differently that antenna works and um, a lot of cell phones and stuff where you have little devices like this do use slot antennas so I say the slot is a negative because you take out the piece that would be an antenna and then leave the rest in place. It's sort of like a negative. Um, a negative, a, a positive would be the, the piece itself. A negative is what's left over when you cut out the piece. So that's a slot antenna. There was a um, story in QST. This guy wanted a two meter antenna and his HOA was just I mean anything resembling copper was not permitted however it is law federal law that 
you are able to put up a satellite antenna, like a dish network kind of thing, They're about this big. So that's what he put up. He put up one of those, cut the slot, fed it for two meters, and that was his two meter antenna. And of course, completely bamboozles everybody. Nobody knows what they're looking at. They think they're looking at a satellite dish. Um, and you can do that actually on any frequency, but when you get up into HF, they're mighty big. So they're more used at UHF, microwave, and on up. But they do work. So um, there was an article in QST a few years ago. <coughs> Let's see if we can find it. Um, I'm going to, I can't, I can't, let's see. Okay, we're going to go to the screen. Now that won't work unless I do that. Okay, now we can go to another tab. And uh, I'm going to go to the league because I never remember the actual URL for QST. So we'll go to QST. It's right there. And QST, come on. Okay, and I'm going to log in again. I talked to Steve Goodgame, and he says he's tried to figure out how to do um, how to do single sign-on. So you only have to uh, sign on in one. By the way, this this thing here about ARRL being the new publisher of Gordon West's uh, books, I talked with them about that. They're adding this to the existing. Uh, stuff that the league already has. Okay, so uh, his books are nice because they're in color, um, but my beef with him is that I think he teaches the test more than I do. I try to teach ham radio. Okay, let's go to the search and we're going to enter the keyword slot antenna. And we're going to look at all editions and see what we can find. Try searching for something less generic. Okay, slot. Uh, slotted, tapered, swaged. Okay. Function through IP network simultaneously. Permanent. Oh, these are the ads. They hit everything in the ads. They've got the ads indexed too. Um, oh, that makes it. I'd like to make it slot plus antenna. Um, see, all of these are ads. You know, a lot of people. Okay. Fox, the ISA slot. No, I don't like that. Let's see if we can do. I don't, I don't know how sophisticated this is. We'll do quote slot antenna unquote. Okay. Okay, these talks about the handbook and, and so on has them using a skeleton slot antenna at 15 feet. There's an article on this. Come on, where is it? A slot cube antenna for six meters. Two meter slot cube. Two meter mobile. Well, I'm sorry, I am not. Here's a slot antenna for 24 gigahertz. And 16 page. Okay, here it is. And what are you going to do? Ignore me now? There we go. An efficient two meter antenna disguised as a TV satellite dish. Okay, and you can see in the picture right here where the slot is. And 
On the next page, it's going to tell you, see, this is how it was fed. And there's your choke ballon. Here's what it looked like. Here's where it worked on different frequencies and so on. So uh, this is the article on the slot antenna. Um, that is not really what I wanted to do. Let's see if I can find that again. Okay, so we are in the March 2016 QST on page 37. So there you go, slot antenna. Slot antenna, very good. Okay, uh, let's see where we so a little information about slots. Um, yes, now on Wi-Fi antennas, uh, no information. If, well, there you go. There's some information. Uh, Bruce Wayne, <laughs> got the Batman logo there. Hi, Dave and Augie's from Silvis, Illinois, where it's 47 and Clouder. Cloudy. And I'm wondering if you could explain the Brewster's angle and how it pertains to the takeoff of angle of ground-mounted vertical antenna. Well, let's take a look in Wikipedia at Brewster's angle. It's a angle. Angle of incidence for which, oh, okay. Um, here you go. If you've got an unpolarized uh, ray here, meaning that it's going in all directions, and if it is at less than the Brewster angle, uh, it will be polarized. Uh, this, uh, by the way, is how Polaroid sunglasses work. If you get light coming at you from an angle like this, the polarizers will cut it out. Now, that, how would this work with a antenna? Presumably the antenna would be here, and it's putting stuff out at this. I have never heard of Brewster's angle being used in connection with uh, an explanation of how vertical antennas work. So I would, <coughs> excuse me. So I would ask you to please send me a link to the article that mentions the use of the concept of Brewster's angle uh, in reference to a vertical, okay? But it's an angle from optics that, and you know, you all of you have seen mirages. As you're driving down a hot highway, Way down at the end, you can see blue sky, you know, that's kind of over the highway. What that is, is the light is reflected up. The light doesn't enter the concrete. The light is reflected by the concrete back at you. And this is one reason for the polarizing. Uh, if you turn them one way, you'll see that light. If you turn it the other way, you don't. Okay, hope that helps. Dang, hex beam issues abound. Oh, yeah. Uh, Thomas KC0VNY. Dave, what's your opinion of the current market for used HF transceivers? Uh, seems like 15 to 20 year old radios are nearly the cost of a brand new model. What is the converging point of cost to age? Okay, if you have somebody who wants as much as an ICOM 7300, for their old radio, they're engaging in wishful thinking. The ICOM 7300, when it came out, um, had so many features and was so capable that it really affected the used market because there is no older radio that's any better than the 7300, except for very, very few, like the FT DX 9000 or 5000, something like that, uh, or a top of the line Kenwood, the 850. Um, the ICOM 7300, which is the reference station radio still, even though the radio has been on the market about 10 years, um, you know, I talked with ICOM a little bit about that. Uh, the 
FT710 uh, Yesu is getting to be very popular. Um, it is not technically an entirely SDR radio. It's got a couple stages of heterodyning ahead of the digitization. Whereas the ICOM 7000 digitizes at the RF frequency. Now there is an amplifier in the ICOM radio. And uh, the coming off of that amplifier, the amplifier band uh, puts a band pass filter around the band that you want, okay? And then that goes in to be digitized. Um, I've got this set up with that little $250 option where you can put a little switch in there. It has very high quality amplifier that will also feed off a link to my SDR radio straight out at the point where the signal is digitized, um, which is a nice thing. But it's a long story to tell you that with the advent of the 7300, um, used prices went down. Because for what you would pay for a used radio that was not as good as an ICOM 7300, uh, the ICOM 7300 price put a top on the market. So a lot of people aren't happy with that, but that's life in the big city. So, um, I would recommend, if you want to pay a lot of money for a used rig, the ICOM 7300 will do essentially anything those old rigs will do, and do it better. Now, there are some people who claim that the ICOM 7300 front end, which goes to the digitizer, is... Uh, subject to overload. I have never had that happen to me. Um, and that's what that front end amplifier is for. Um, they've got a very broad front end on that thing. They, what, 36 bit? Something, no, it's not 36 bit, 24 bit, something like that. It's a well of a good uh, uh, digital readout. Okay, so I would think that the point of the cost of the ICOM 7300, I would not buy a used radio more expensive than that. In spite of what anybody says, the ICOM 7300 is a mighty fine radio. As you've been in ham radio for three, four, five, ten years, you'll probably have explored every single feature in the uh, 7310 and it might be nice to move up to the 7610. Now I have used the 7610. I had one loaned to me. Uh, Brad Rich N6 Oh no. I forgot his last name last week. Now his call this week. Um, he got his call in California. So, N6GR, I talked to him last week, okay. Um, he's the one who loaned me the 7610, and he's the one who reminded me that it was time to return it. It's a very nice radio. So, very good. All right, uh, so that's what I would say about the radios. The brand new radios like the 7610, which I will grant you, you know, this is interesting. I was thinking about this the other day with respect to chameleon antennas. Chameleon antennas makes antennas, and they're not on the market for a long time till you go to the next big thing that they're doing. Whereas the big Japanese manufacturers will sell a radio for years you can get the same radio and these are mighty fine radios um, 
and I have no complaints about the 7300. Um, no, I really don't. So, I mean, it, it cost me the employee price to get it, and then spent a quarter of that on that little board in there. Jeez. Okay. Uh, Sir Isaac Newton says, hi from Brazil. Hello. Grant Grove, when using an auto-tuner, is there any difference when the antenna is resonant at one frequency and switching to a higher or lower frequency? Is it more efficient to use the tuner moving up to tune? Um, if you're using the tuner, it, it depends on what the antenna is. The If it's an antenna that's like a random wire, something like that, you're going to have to move the antenna tuner to tune it to the, the new frequency. If it's a multi-band antenna, go ahead and switch bands and then use the tuner on that band. Um, now as soon as you do that, the antenna will present a completely different characteristic impedance to you. So you're going to have to tune. So um, you can't just use the tuner knob to take it up in frequency. Tuners are designed to take reflected power and send it back to the transmitter. Er, sorry, excuse me, my bad. Tuners are used to reflect back to the antenna the power that they reflect back so that it can have another chance to get radiated. Um, I would say yeah, I, I think, you know, it depends switching to a higher or lower fre frequency. If you have an antenna that is better at another frequency, try to run it as close to resonance as you can. I think you're going to get the most out of it. Hope that helps, Grant. K, K4, GKG. K9 GCP radio breaks in overcast. Uh, oh, okay. Breaks in the overcast. All right. Thank you. Leo Gustafson. I'm Marty from Montana. Okay. Uh, Bill Myers, K-A-H-G-I-M. Hi, Dave and all Augies. Glenn Martin. Theodore, there was a six-meter slot antenna video on YouTube I saw in the past few days. Oh, yeah, I'm sure there's YouTube videos. Leo, ha, that looks like my log. I'm going to get organized someday when I have time. Well, that is my log. I've got a stamp that when I have enough time between QSOs, I've st put the stamp down and it's got a form to fill out. So, <coughs> so I make sure that I've captured all the relevant information. Okay. Um... Looks like my log, let's see, great live stream always. How does the reflector on a Yagi intercept enough RF to reflect more than a few percent in the forward direction? I guess the easiest thing would be to say that it's magic, but it's not. Um, you have to look at the configuration of an antenna from the point of view of a radio wave. Um, the, and you can do this if you've got, they had this in my high school physics class, you could put things in uh, this shallow tub of water and get some kind of an exciter to go up and down and you'd, you'd see the waves go out. And if you had two things going up and down, you could see the interference patterns. Uh, between those waves. And if you took something like a driven element on a uh, Yagi and do that and you put the reflector and the directors you'd see where the energy goes. So you've got to look at it from the point of view of a radio wave. We are not trying to do like a parabolic capture of the energy or anything like that. All of the elements work in unison uh, to do this. 
And what you have happen is that, you know, the basic antenna puts out the waves, which just go out. But the reflector kind of reacts to that and uh, creates an interference pattern. And you could do this with light. Creates an interference pattern between the reflector and the driven element. And then the directors out front participate in that um, interference pattern. Optical interference, well, radio waves are optical. You can do this with light. And it, if you look again in this uh, water, shallow water table where you've got analog physical equivalents to these things right here, you can see how the uh, different interference patterns, they seem near the antenna to be chaotic. That's called the near field. And then beyond a certain point, they start actually moving coherently. That's the far field. So in the near field, and it depends on the gain of the antenna how big the near field is, you'll see what looks like chaos. But as you get further away, you get into the far field and you have planar waves going out. Okay. Um, I should make such a little table and see if we can't use it for do that. Okay. Let's see. So that's how it works. Uh, you've got to think of the thing not with your eyes, but pretend you're a radio wave and you're trying to transmit and this other thing is out there and is reflecting enough power to create an interference pattern. And then that interference pattern interferes with other interference patterns from the other element. And in the near field, it's chaos. Uh, in the far field, things all come together. Okay. Now, what, I, I'm just going to mention this because I think I probably should mention this. When it comes to RF safety, all of the uh, calculators that we have, including the one at the league, calculate for the far field. But if you are in the near field, the answer can be quite different. And they don't have anything up yet that talks about uh, RF hazards in the near field. Now at RF, uh, at HF, it's not so much of an issue. But when you get into microwave and stuff like that, it is. I was told once, I was in a lab, I think at Brigham Young, and was walking by an instrument that had a little tiny microwave fitting for a waveguide. And I was kind of looking at it, and the first thing you want to do is look down the waveguide. And some guy put his hand on my shoulder and said, do not do that, ever. Uh, he said, basically, this thing is turned off right now. But if you look down that tube when this thing is on, it will cook your eye. And uh, I agreed that would not be a good thing that I wanted to have happen. So I'm always very careful when I'm around um, Waveguide. Okay, let's see. Looks like my log, okay. That's the reflector. Try watching State of the Union. Yeah, it's very political. I mean, the president never actually assesses the State of the Union, which he's supposed to. It's a campaign speech. And, yeah. I uh, hate mucinex side effects throw me for loop. Luckily, pseudofenadrine is available in Oregon again. Now, if I could just find a finished sauna. There you go. And Leo says, Godspeed to Bob Heil. Yes, Bob Heil passed away. Um, I have met Bob. I've talked with him on the air. He 
was a very well-known ham radio operator. He is the only non-musician in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And that is because when these rock bands were first starting out in the 60s and 70s, they didn't know anything about sound systems, but Bob did. And he fitted up a number of the big headline groups with their sound systems for their stages. Got their microphones, mixers, amplifiers, speakers, everything put together for those. And some extraordinarily complex equipment. And uh, the bands liked him so much that somebody nominated him for the Hall of Fame. He's in the, the Hall of Fame. So um, now he was uh, on ham radio. Oh, what's the name of that program? Um, ham radio today or something like that. Anyway, uh, and, and my memory's going blank. And I'm younger than Joe Biden, so um, my memory's going blank. I'm trying to remember. But he is, uh, his little group of people that were on ham radio made a little show every Wednesday, which is why we're on Thursday, by the way. Um, although that show now has moved to Friday, so. Um, he was quite a man. I didn't always agree with him. For example, in grounding. Now, he was working with on-stage musicians where ground loops were a death knell to that performance. And so he grounded a little differently to keep from having ground loops. Uh, but in the ham station, we're not setting up something temporary. We're setting something up proper, and we should ground properly. Now, if you're out doing POTA from the back of your car, I don't care what you have for your ground system. Probably you want to use the car's chassis uh, for that. But um, the chassis acts more as a counterpoise. It's uh, capacitive. Counterpoises are capacitive. Grounds are resistive. Two different things. So, um, anyway, yeah, uh, the last time I saw Bob Isle was at the, I guess it was before the pandemic, because they stopped doing their ham fest. If you have not heard, the Albuquerque ham fest is back on this year. They didn't do it last year because they couldn't find the volunteers and they lost their venue. Well, they have found a new venue and they're going to be up in September and I definitely am planning on being there and I definitely am planning on giving a presentation and look forward to um, being there and, and meeting you guys and, and so on. Uh, we can drive from here to Albuquerque in one day, so we will do that, and we will be ready to go. My wife will come with me. She'll come to the banquet, too, but otherwise she'll be looking in art galleries and same th things like that, and there's a lot of art in uh, Albuquerque. So, yes, Bob Heil is a silent key. He must have been very old. Chris Goodman, K0BLU, hello from St. Cloud, Minnesota, where warm socks are still trending. Yes. Um, John, N5WMS, good evening, David. Chris Goodman, K0BLU, remembering Bob Heil, who performed a moon bounce using the Mosley 2M antenna with the encouragement of Alan Shepard. And it all began after his learning to play a Hammond organ. The Hammond organs were and are favorites among the rock bands because the way they are set up, you have to preset. They have these presets with slider bars. And it puts in the fundamental, the second harmonic, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and so on. 
It also puts in the overtones. <coughs> so like the overtone from a C is a G. Just the G right above it. That's the first overtone. And you get all these other things in music. And with the draw bars on the Hammond organ, you can make any sound you want. And they did. And I've seen bands on stage fiddling with their little sliders and everything like that. And they can make amazing things. The Hammond organ was the first really successful electronic organ. Um, and purists like church organists would uh, hold their noses in the air. Although the chapel I grew up in in Glendale, California had a Hammond organ. And I was just amazed uh, by it. I was learning piano at the time, which I gave up on far too soon. Uh, and I have stopped playing the organ at church now because of the shaky fingers. Um, I don't know, I miss it, but uh, there are several organs at church, so it's not like I'm filling a need, really. But uh, anyway, Alan Shepard, yes. Now, the Mosley 2-meter antenna, uh, there's a lot to moon bounce. I suppose I should do a video on moon bounce. Um, it's... Joe Taylor has invented a new mode. Well, his JT-65 was originally intended for moon bounce with a two-minute cycle rather than a one-minute cycle. And he has an echo mode now for uh, moon bounce to where you can point your antenna at the moon, send out a signal, and see if you receive it back again. The moon, as a reflector, is a terrible reflector. It's full of bumps and valleys and craters, plus it's round. And so you could equally well bounce off a peak over on the side of the moon as from some mare or sea right straight in like that. And so you're getting all kinds of inner symbol interference back from the moon. That can be dealt with if you have the right um, data encoding techniques. And uh, Bob Heil, or not Bob Heil, um, Joe Taylor's got that mastered. Okay. Hey Dave, good evening. Question, would a ballon have any impact on duplex operation considering an end fed for six meter repeater I would have to ask the question why since the six meter antenna is um, three meters long which is about ten feet um, you're going to be putting it on the side of a tower anyway why not just feed it as a dipole but, in all fairness, a dipole is a dipole is a dipole, regardless of how it is fed. So if you want to end feed it, you certainly can do that. Now, I will warn you that at six meters, um, you're going to get a lot of secondary effects. And uh, my assistant and I, uh, Aiden, is coming tomorrow. Uh, put up two six meter antennas. One was made with insulated wire with a lot of wire wrapped back on it. The other was made of plain copper with a lot wrapped back on it. And we put that into the VNA and the nano VNA and could not make heads nor tails of what we were seeing coming back. So uh, we went to 40 meters. We created a 40 meter standard classic dipole, put it up as a sloper, because I've only got one really tall pole that's 30 feet. And we did another one with insulated wire, so we had insulated and um, non-insulated, and the whole, now the insulated antenna 
was a few inches shorter. And the reason for that is because of the insulation, the velocity factor through the wire is less than the velocity factor through a wire without insulation. That aside, wrapping back insulated wire on the end of a dipole didn't matter. It didn't affect the tuning. We left a lot on, then we went out and chopped some off and things like that. And what we found out was if you're putting up a dipole with insulated wire and you want to wrap some of it back in order to get it tuned right, go ahead, it works. Okay. So um, the ballon, you're going to have to take into account when you're getting up to 50 megahertz that what looks like a coil to you might look more like a capacitor to the RF. Um, you start to get into weird, weird effects. So beware of that. Do some measuring. Now your nano VNA will go up to uh, well over a gigahertz. So you can measure a lot of this. And for example, you've got a coil. You can measure that with the VNA. Uh, to see where it has resonances and so on. Okay, Rex Allen, Dave, try the Nile Med sinus rinse bottle with warm water. My mother used to do sinus rinses, and I tried one once and felt like I was drowning. So, never done it again. But it uh, works very well for me. I've used for many years now. Last sinus infection was over eight years ago. I don't get sinus infections, per se. <coughs> I do get throat infections. That's viral. David Hodge, Hodge, don't know. Hodgson? Hodgson? Um, you know, people who have names with silent letters in them, often somehow that letter makes it into the pronunciation. He says, good morning, David, from Thailand, Hotel S0ZQA. Um, Chris Goodman, K0BLU, Dave, I have a box of Nile Med sinus rinse samples. I can send you for free. Uh, Chris, I'm sorry, but no, I'm not doing another sinus rinse again. I tried one 70 years ago, and it was a bad experience. They're for somebody, but not for everybody. So thank you. Um, thank you very much, Chris, for offering that. Hoodoo, hi, Dave. What do you think about the new law proposed about stripping HOAs of their ability to deny licensed TAM radio operators to put up the antennas on their property? That has been kicked around for 40 years. Um, the FCC came out with PRB1 years ago, which say that local governments can't prohibit hams from putting up a reasonable antenna. However, that does not apply to homeowner associations, which are private. So, what you have to do there. Yes, the league has been trying to get one passed for many years. Now, there's nuances in the way the thing is phrased. Um, and so I hope this one is a good one. Um, let's see, it's March. They've got a while to go before their vacation break if they can pass it. There's something called the Omnibus Bill, which is passed at the end of every session. The Omnibus Bill contains all the little bills that didn't get brought up for debate, but on which 100% of the people there agree should be law. Now, there was an HOA-related bill a few years ago, it was put in the omnibus bill, but one senator 
changed his mind, didn't want it. One senator. And so it didn't end up in the omnibus bill because the omnibus bill was things that everybody agreed on. And believe it or not, there's a lot of those. What we see on the evening news are the big political items, but the ordinary work of Congress goes on and on and on under the covers. We never see it. Okay. Uh, seventh signature, if using any kind of rinse, always use distilled water. I am planning to activate a park on 60 meters. Do you have any suggestions? Ken, bring an alternate antenna to work on another band. 60 meters is a weird band. There are only five frequencies that we're allowed to use. Uh, we're secondary on the band. Um, very few hams have an antenna for 60 meters. Very few. And um, it's mostly the band is used by pre-planned exercises and stuff like that. One of the nice things about the band in the event of an emergency is that you can have cross-channel uh, communications uh, but with, other, with other agencies. So we're talking on frequencies we're allowed to use and they're using those same frequencies, okay. So that is uh, the use for it. Almost all, as far as I know, all makers of vertical antennas do not include 60 meters. There's no demand for it. If you're the kind of guy who likes 60 meters, you can put up your own antenna. Note that there are severe power limitations on 60 meters. So you're not going to find a bunch of people just listening on 60 meters. That's why I'm saying you can try it. But bring another antenna in case you want to change bands. Um, so, um, RS Greetings Dave from California. Hope you are well. Rick and KN6 UTF. Moon bouncing is a different level of communications. You aim an antenna in an empty space where the moon will be there in 11 seconds and from there bounce will have to go into a direction of empty space. Um, the moon is spherical, okay? So if you blast it with the radio wave, it's actually going to bounce them in all directions, including back at you. Now the path loss is over 200 dB. And in most kinds of communications, that's too much path loss. And the moon over an 11 second period will stay in position long enough uh, that you can you know, bounce a few signals off of it. But the really big hairy moon bouncers will have phased array Yaggies, huge mass of them, and the antenna system will not only rotate in azimuth, but also in elevation. So it can follow the moon. And these people run full legal power on 2 meters, 70 centimeters, and so on. And that helps with the path loss equation. Um, then you need that same kind of antenna system to get pick up enough signal out of the noise to hear it. Unless you do some special coding. And if you do the coding, C-O-D-I-N-G, um, you put enough coding in there, you add a little bit of coding that gains you a dB. Add a little more coding that gains you another dB. And you can keep doing this till you get these big, hairy, long codes, like JT65, that take two minutes to send, and all they send is 13 bits. All the other bits are parity bits. And then your computer, on the other end, you take whatever garbled mess comes down to you, and they go through an algorithm and start tossing bits that they don't like, 
and finally putting the whole thing back together into those 13 bits, which is call sign and stuff like that. Okay, so that really does work. Now, we have communications with the Voyagers. The Voyager 1 is probably dead. It's sending nonsense back uh, from uh, the spacecraft. It has been for about six months. And they lost it for a little while. Got it repointed. And they use Reed Solomon. No, not Reed Solomon. They use convolu convolutional coding and Viterbi decoding which is quite fascinating. Okay, we need to get on the air, don't we? Uh, bratwurst and eggs for dinner tonight. Oh, you know what I would like is uh, some sauerkraut along with that. Wow. Yeah, uh, Reggie, the, the problem um, is that they only allow, I think, like 50 watts or something, effective radiated power, which means um, dipoles and the rig turned down to 50 watts. And it's not a band of frequencies, it's actually five channels. And one of the reasons it isn't used much is because if you try to send CW, it's got to be straight down the middle of that channel. And so only one pair of hams can do CW, and they hog the whole channel. So we're trying to get that uh, a little bit better. Okay, Leo Gustafsson adds $10 to the uh, channel funds, and I really appreciate that. Okay, now, we've got to do drawing. By the way, in uh, I did, uh, I don't know if it's come out yet. This is from Alpha Antennas. Okay, it's the hub for their portable antenna. And I had a gray one from them, and the thing fell over, and the hub cracked. It's 3D printed, and it, the laminations came apart on it. So to finish the test, we drilled all the way through down to the bottom and put screws down on all of this to the point it came out the other side. I mentioned that to the guy who owns Alpha Antennas. And that's, now these are nuts because he's got machine screws going down there from this side over here. And it will make this thing much stronger. Now, I'm going to set up that antenna again, use this hub, and we'll check it for all the usual kinds of things, but I'm going to push it over. I'm going to push it over the same way it went over before, and we'll see how well it does. If it does well, I'll recommend it and say it's a, a good antenna for you. Although I would like to encourage them to get Let's get that level there. That looks more like an A than an alpha. An alpha, the two cross a little closer to the middle. Okay, and Chris Goodman, K0BLU, has added um, $10. And he says, onward to daylight savings time. Oh, yes. Okay, now let's see what we can pick up on the radio. Oh, we've got to do the drawing first. The drawing. Now, I've kind of sorted these as best I can, or not sorted them, but unsorted them. So I'm going to do my usual, and I'm going to put my finger somewhere in the middle here. And we will take the card that is underneath my finger, which is Glenn Martin, N0QFT, Albany, uh, Missouri. Okay, he's the one who checks in from far west Missouri. Okay, and what he is getting is this book, um, Ham Radio DX, The Complete Guide. Um, lots of stuff in here, lots of opinion. My opinions may be different, but Glenn, this will be in the mail to you 
probably tomorrow. Okay, certainly not today. But I've got to go up and see the pulmonologist tomorrow up in Delta. And since I'm going to be in Delta anyway, I've got to go pet my airplane. So, And Bill Myers, K-A-8-G-I-M, puts in $10 and says, Thanks for another excellent live stream, Dave. Thank you very much, Bill. I appreciate that. Now, I've got to get my logbook down here. Where to go? It's right here. Okay. And today is eighth uh, March UTC. Eight March. Okay, we're gonna set the antenna to D, which is the vertical. And I'm gonna turn that on and set it to go up. Got a thing. Okay, band 7210. Uh, now let's turn on the radio. First of all, I'm going to disconnect the whisper transmitter, which has been transmitting all the time on uh, my NFED half wave. It uses the ARRL uh, Ballon. But I, I don't want to blow out the box, so I, I'm just going to put this over to the side for right now. And I'm going to pick up the microphone, turn on the radio. Okay. Is this frequency in use? Is this frequency in use? No, it is not. So we are on 7212. 7212 on 40 meters. Okay. Did that get out? No. 7212. Okay, that's the frequency, 7212. This is KE0OG, and uh, I am looking for supporters. This is a live stream that is going out on YouTube, and uh, it's a YouTube demonetized uh, live stream because that's the way it should be. Anyway, I'm looking for people who would like to talk to Dave, KE0OG, on the air. And so I will say, uh, let me see, we're starting here at 2.57. Okay. Um, QRZ, anybody for KE0OG? Kilo Charlie Zero, Delta Whiskey Zulu. Delta Whiskey Zulu. Kilo Charlie Zero, Delta Whiskey Zulu. This is KE0OG, name is Dave in Colorado. And you're definitely 5x9 here. So, back to you. QSL, Dave. QSL, thank you very much. And you are about 5'7 into Minnesota. The name here is Don, Delta Oscar November. And I was watching the stream, so I turned on the app, and I wanted to make sure I got through to you. Back to you. Okay, well, very good. My amp is off at the moment. I'm just doing 100 watts. Um, Don, tell me what kind of station you got there. Well, Dave, you'll be pleased to hear that based on your recommendations, when I started in ham radio three years ago, I purchased an ICOM 7300. I have since acquired a second one used that I use for POTA and as a backup to this station. And I have an Ameritron AL811H amp that I replaced the tubes with the uh, 572B tubes. And uh, I've got, this is a 40 meter double bazooka bi uh, dipole antenna that I am on. About 35 feet. Back to you. Well, very good. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, I'm running right now on a vertical. It is made by Step IR. It's called the Big IR. And uh, it 
is a nice uh, consistent antenna does nice consistent things so uh, thank you very much I'm gonna say 73 to you and uh, KC0 DWZ back to you for your final and then I'm gonna call QRZ again thank you Dave I'll let you get on to others but I'm happy to have you in my log after three years so 73 uh, have a great uh, rest of your stream and I'll be watching KC0 DWZ clear okay very good this is KE0 OG QRZ Uh, the Whiskey 7 Alpha station coming in. Okay, Whiskey 7 Alpha Sierra Yankee. Uh, the name here is Dave, and uh, you're about a 5 by 7 I think. Um, there is a lot of static tonight, uh, but I'm picking you out just fine. So, back to you. Yes, it is. It certainly is. Thank you very much for all your videos. I appreciate it. Uh, W7ASY, the name here is Tim, Tango India Mike, and we are located just south of Reno, Nevada, and north of Carson City. Over. I uh, was out in that area a couple years ago when I went out to a flight school in Reno to finish up my sport pilot license. I liked the area. It was really nice there, and people were quite friendly. And I did my flying out of Carson City. Nice place. So, tell me a little bit about your station. I'm running 100 watts to a vertical. QSL, I've seen, uh, seen a lot of your videos, so I know what you're running there. Uh, what we're running here is a Flex 6600 uh, and a uh, KPA, uh, uh, KPA 1500. Uh, into a rotatable uh, stepper, uh, so it does uh, 6 through 40. Uh, I am house sitting for my uh, for my Elmer uh, K7 NIK Nick. Uh, his call again K7 NIK, and uh, we're house sitting while he is on a cruise into the Bahamas. Over. Well, I think you've got the better end of the deal with that flex radio there. And especially that great big giant step by R. Boy, those things are big. And uh, about 1,500 watts, that's cool. And uh, say hi to uh, K7NIK and uh, thank him from me for helping you into ham radio. And uh, I'm going to say 73 on this go around and turn it back to you for a final. W7ASY, KE0OG. Uh, 73. This is KE0 OG QRZ. Oh my goodness, a pile up, and I'm not even DX. Let's try again. Okay, there was an Echo 8, an Echo 8 in there. Kilo Echo 8 Romeo Bravo Yankee. Name here is Dave uh, in southwestern Colorado, 100 watts to a vertical. And uh, nice to meet you this evening. And this is part of a live stream um, where we're just doing this live uh, for fun. See who can get a contact through. So I'm going to put you down into 5x5. Five five. Uh, there's a lot of static tonight. Uh, back to you. Oh, very good there. What's your name again? Dave. Yeah, that's what I keep telling my wife. So, <laughs> the Dave. A good name. A good name to have there. I'm Dave also. So, fine business on that Elenco. That's a fairly rare rig. Um, I have a friend who has one down in California. And uh, they work very well and I understand they're very easy to use. Uh, so, 
I'm going to say 73 to you. Back to you for a final. K-E-8-R-B-Y, K-E-0-O-G. Okay, very good. Yeah, I put in my notch filter there. Um, and so, uh, thank you very much, 73, and this is KE0OG QRZ. Okay, there was a Kilo Alpha 8 in there. Hello, Alpha 8, Golf India Mike. Um, I, it sticks in the back of my mind we've talked before. Um, what's your name and tell me about your station. Roger, Roger, Dave. Uh, Kilo Echo Zero. Oscar Golf, this is Kilo Alpha 8, Golf India Mike. You talked before. Uh, I wanted to talk to you again. And our uh, name here is Bill Bravo India Lima Lima. I'm running an ICOM 7300. Oh, very good. I uh, keep running into people who've got an ICOM 7300s. They're great radios. That's what I'm running today, too. And I'm running a Step IR Big IR Vertical, and which costs more than the 7300. But anyway, um, let's see. I've got you down at about a 5x5. Five five. Uh, how are you hearing me? Oh, my goodness. I think I've sold an awful lot of 7300s. Uh, by the way, I don't get a uh, dividend or interest or anything on that. Um, they're just good radios. So, um, let's see. I was going to question I was going to ask you. Anyway, um, where are you located? Okay, very good. Yeah, I think I filled out a QSL card for you. Uh, and I remember the Bruce uh, part of that. Well, I'm going to say 73 to you. It's been a lot of fun. I'll turn it back to you for a final. K-A-A-G-I-M, K-E-0-O-G. Seventy-three. This is K E zero O G Q R Z. I think there was an Alpha Charlie nine. Could you try again? Roger. This is Alpha Charlie nine Yankee X-ray. Okay, Alpha Charlie nine Yankee X-ray. You're coming in five by nine here. Name is Dave. Located in Southwest Colorado. And on a vertical with 100 watts. So back to you. Tell me your name and where you are. Yeah, my name is Jeff. I live in Avon, Illinois, which is about 30 miles west of Denver. And I got you coming in here at a 5.9. Okay, very good. What kind of equipment are you running there? Go ahead. Well, I got a. Icom 7300, and right now I've got a, uh, oh, heck, MFJ's cobweb antenna up, and it seems to be working pretty good on 40 meters right now. Oh, very good there. Um, the Icom 7300's a nice radio, that's what I'm running, 
the MFJ Cobweb, I had one of those for a while, including the uh, 30 and 40 meter edition. And unfortunately, in the middle of a night, a deer got it. Got, uh, uh, took down one of the guy wires and then tried to run through the antenna and ended up just trashing it. So that was the end of my cobweb. So um, I'm going to say 73 and pass it back to you for a final. AC9YX KE0OG. Oh, Roger that. I never did get my signal report. I just didn't quite catch it, I guess. 5-9. Oh, okay. Thank you for the 5-9, Dave. And I'll say 73 is to you. And I was watching your podcast here, and then I got sidetracked for the phone call. So thanks for coming back to me. And 73s and... Well, thank you very much, and 73 to you, too. And uh, this is KE0OG, QRZ. November 3, Foxtrot Mike Charlie. Here's Kilo Echo Zero, Oscar Call. Your nice 5-9 here in southwestern Colorado. Name is Dave. Uh, back to you. into Reading, Pennsylvania, near Philadelphia. And today, here is Jeff, the Julia Echo, Fox Trot, Fox Trot. And Dave, I feel like I know you already. I really enjoy your videos. Well, I'm glad that you do. I enjoy making them. And uh, this getting on the air during the live stream is a great way to actually talk to people. Um, I do go to HamFest. So I'm going to try now that the Albuquerque Ham Fest is back on, I'll be there, I'll be at Pacificon. Um, looking at Dayton, not sure if I can make it out there or not, uh, but uh, sure would like to. So, uh, Jeff, very, very nice meeting you this evening. Tell me a little bit about your station. Sure, I'm running a new Yezu FTDX test with a Kenwood MC80 um, desktop microphone for my old um, TS940 that I used before uh, I got this Yezu FTDX10. I was inactive on HF for about 25 years, raising a couple of kids, that sort of thing. Uh, last year, that's why Al and I became empty nesters, so decided to get active again on HF and rebuild an HF station. That's how your videos have been helpful to me in um, getting back into HF after a long hiatus. Uh, it's been a lot of fun, and uh, the TDX 10 has been a good radio for me. Uh, running that into a brand new RF kit, a uh, solid state legal limit amplifier from Germany, the RF 2K S. And that's been a lot of fun, too. Been uh, experimenting with that for about three weeks now. And I have those running into a ground mounted Hustler 5 BTV vertical. Uh, so I put that vertical up in September. And then I did a G5 RV at about 40 feet uh, early in December. And then an 80 meter doublet at about 50 feet. Uh, so I was going to take the ladder line and late December. And my next antenna project there, Dave, is going to be an X team. Uh, I'm going to try one of those MFJ uh, 40 to 6 meter X teams and uh, see how that works out. And I'm also hoping to get on 160 meters uh, with an inverted L. So I'm looking forward to the spring arriving in Pennsylvania. KE 0 OG from November 3, Fox Mike Charlie. November 3, Fox Mike Charlie. Very good. KE 0 OG here. Well, that's a very nice station you've got there. I like the ASU radios. Uh, I have up on the shelf an FTDX 3000 that I put up there when I got the uh, ICOM 7300 because the ICOM 7300 was the reference station so I figure if I'm going to refer other people to that I'd better have that myself so it's been a very very nice talking to you there in Pennsylvania and you've got quite a nice station and I know the bit about empty nesters been there done that and I remember when my son went off to college. He was the first to go off to college. I was uh, thinking, oh man, he's been so much trouble. I'll be happy to see him go to college and just hear from him once a week or something. Ah, uh, from the first day, I missed him terribly. I, I tell you, it just hit me a lot harder than I thought I would. 
Well, I'm going to say 73 on this go around. I'll turn it back to you for a final in 3 FMC. Here's KE0OG 73. Well, very good there, Dave. Real pleasure speaking to you. And um, I look forward to uh, uh, watching your videos again soon. Whatever I'm doing some research, you always seem to pop up with some useful information. So, again, uh, certainly much appreciated. Uh, have a great evening. My brother's out in Boulder, Colorado. He's coming out to Pennsylvania here in a couple of weeks uh, for my parents' um, 80th birthday party. So, uh, we have a Colorado connection. I do get out there on occasion. He loves it out there. He's been out there over 30 years. So, we'll catch up another time there, Dave. 73 KE0 OG from November 3 Ford Motor Company. Good night. 73, and I'm going to be QRT because the live stream's ending here. <laughs> oh, did you hear that? Other people still wanted to talk. That is cool. I had fun with that. So let's see. Um, that wraps up our live stream for the, the week. And I'll try to catch up on getting QSL cards out. And I'll get that uh, book out to the winner. And we'll just have a wonderful week. So until we next meet, 73.